Good morning, everyone. <laughs> so a very warm welcome to everyone as we join together for worship this morning here in Whitehead Presbyterian Church. You're all very welcome. If you're visiting with us or here for the first time, or if you join us online later, you're very welcome indeed. And later on today, we have at four o'clock our afternoon service, so we do. So let me invite you all back to church. Let me invite you, you to invite someone else to come along with you and come and come and share and worship as we come and to worship God this afternoon at 4 p.m. And so after our service today, we also have refreshments here in the welcome area. So do please come and join us for extra fellowship and friendship over refreshments. And so if you require the services of a minister, please do contact myself in the first instance or your district elder. Tomorrow evening as part of, I need to get my glasses. Uh, tomorrow evening as part of our Common Ground Summer Week uh, event with, with Bally Carry and Island McGee churches, there will be a volunteer evening in, in Bally Carry church halls from half past seven in the evening. This is for everyone, young and the young at heart. Although it is geared towards youth, as, as Catherine and Peters has said, but this is for everyone to play their part. So it is. So do please consider coming along tomorrow evening in Ballycarry Church Halls from half past seven to volunteer for this volunteer evening. Notice to all members of church committee, Church Committee will meet this coming Tuesday the 14th of May in the church office from half past seven. There will be one home group meeting this week. The home group that is led by Alec will meet this coming Wednesday from half past seven in the home of Lex and Helen. We meet again for prayer on Saturday morning upstairs in the Bradley room from 10 o'clock, so please do come, you're welcome. Can I remind you of Christian Aid envelopes are here at the front or in the vestibule and next Sunday is the very latest that we can receive them for counting on the Monday by the community. Preliminary notice for members of Kirk Session. Kirk Session will meet on the notice the change of day, Wednesday the 22nd of May in the Bradley room. So there's a change of time and a or change of day and change of location. So it's in, on Wednesday the 22nd of May in the Bradley Room. Next Sunday the 19th of May we have two services here and we meet again for worship at 11 o'clock in the morning and that's going to be led by Trevor Long. Also next Sunday evening the 19th of May can I invite you back to our service of prayer and praise along with our friends from Ballycarry and Island McGee Church. This will be here in the church and it will be our shared common ground service of worship and that takes place from half past seven in the evening. So half past seven next Sunday evening here in the church. Thank you. These are all our announcements. Let us worship God. <laughs> This morning. It's lovely to see the sun trying to come back out, isn't it? It was getting a bit misty as I was coming round the coast, but hopefully by the time we're outside again, the sun will have broken through again. Psalm 63 says this, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in your sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. We're going to sing, we love the place, O oh God. <laughs>
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads in preparation to pray, help us set aside all other thoughts to focus the eyes of our hearts on you and open our hearts to receive your love that we may indeed worship you alone. Almighty and ever-living God, we worship you. We bow before you, acknowledging that you are Lord of all. You set the stars in space and hold them there in motion and still took time to design the primroses in a mossy bank. You inhabit glory unimaginable, and yet you desire to live in our hearts. We respond this morning with love and praise. You alone are worthy to be worshipped, honoured and adored. Father God, we come before you in Jesus' name, confessing that in our actions and reactions, we have failed you. In our loving and forgiving, we have fallen short of your mark. In our believing and our trusting, we have denied your grace and power. In silence, we lay before you the specific sins which are clouding our relationship with you just now. We believe that if we confess our sins, you will forgive us and cleanse us. Thank you for that grace. And so, may we live as those who know we have been forgiven because of what Jesus has done in our lives. In the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first Bible reading is from Jeremiah. It's on page 789. And it's Jeremiah chapter 29, and we're starting at verse 11. So page 789 in the Bibles in front of you. <clears throat> For I know I have for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Amen. What games did you play when you were wee? Come on, think back. Now I know for some of us it's a long time ago. Why? What games did you play when you were at school? When you were tiny? Hopscotch. Hopscotch, yes it was a good one. It got you out in the fresh air. Do you remember playing hide and seek? Yes. Do some of you still play hide and seek with grandchildren? Yeah. When my grandchildren were small, they loved playing hide and seek. There was only one problem. They were very little and they didn't really understand how the game was supposed to work. And because they didn't understand, they always hid in the same place. They would run and hide and then call, Rambovic, Rambovic, count! And he had to count to ten and then say, here I come, ready or not. And he would always hide behind the city. No matter how often they hid, they were always behind the city. And then sometimes they told Grandpa Victor to hide and he would squeeze into their princess tent 
Now, for those of you who don't know, a princess tent is only about this height and it's tiny and it sits in the corner of the living room for little girls to play princess castles. He would squeeze into this princess tent and they knew that was where they needed to go to find him. There was lots of squealing and excitement every time they pushed back the flap and saw him there. You know, God's like that. Sometimes it may feel like he is hiding from us, but he's not. He's always in the same place because he wants us to find him. We can wander off, go far away from him, do whatever we like. But God will always be waiting right where he has always been. He wants us to find him. It's God's greatest desire that we should look for him and find him. And that having found him, we would enter into relationship with him. When we find him, when we remember all that he has done for us, we will indeed love him with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and all our strength. In fact, with everything we have all over again. Let's sing again. This time, seek ye first the kingdom of God.
<clears throat> we don't know why we have so many of this world's benefits, while others have so few. But we are filled with gratitude for the generosity you have shown to us. Accept these our gifts which we give to you in love. Bless them that they may bring hope and benefit to those in need. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our second reading is in the book of Acts, chapter 17, and it's on page 1113 in the Bibles and the Pews. Acts chapter 17, and we're going to start reading at verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Amen. We're going to pray again. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we thank you for all your blessings. We thank you for the things that bring us together, for shared worship, fellowship in prayer, for opportunities to read and study the Bible together, the forging of bonds and friendships, ways to express together a caring, loving spirit in our congregation, our homes and our communities. And we pray that all will be able to see whose we are and whom we serve. Accept our love and thanks in the Saviour's name. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for those who feel they have no need of you. Those whose suffering and sorrow are too great for us to share. We remember those who wait and pray in patience. Those who agonize over injustice. those who show mercy and compassion. Bless those whose purity and grace inspire others. And those who work for peace, where no peace seems possible. And those whose witness to truth and justice 
has brought them suffering. Father, we pray for all those who are suffering the pain of bereavement and the loneliness of life without a loved one. In the silence we bring before your throne those in our own families and communities for whom we seek healing, peace and restoration. Lord, teach us to pray with love and understanding. To try to enter into the real needs that are around us. And to believe that through our prayers, you heal and bless through Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. <coughs> our third hymn, Praise is Safe in the Shadow of the Lord. time to time when Judah broke the rules or rebelled against their masters, an army would be sent and captives would be seized and taken away to teach the others a lesson. 
and to bring those left behind back into line. At the start of chapter 29, the whole court has been taken off to Babylon. King Jehoiakim, the Queen Mother, the eunuchs, the court officials, the priests, and the master craftsmen all guarded off into exile. In chapter 1, verse 5, we read that God appointed, and in verse 9, that he anointed Jeremiah to speak out against the wrongdoing of the people. They had forsaken God, turned to idols, and broken other commandments by defiling the temple and oppressing one another. Jeremiah's view of human beings is not very pretty, but it is accurate. In chapter 17, verses 9 and 10, he says, The human heart is sick and beyond cure by anyone other than God. Jeremiah emphasizes that Judah finds itself where it is, not because of any lack on God's part, but because they have turned away from him. They've been making their own plans, doing whatever they want, acting like they don't need God, and that has had consequences. God will not allow human sin to continue unchecked. And Jeremiah warned them that the judgment was coming. He begged them repeatedly to stop what they were doing and repent. The words turn around or repent are mentioned over 100 times in this book. And Jeremiah promises that when the people turn from their sins and return to God and repent, they will receive forgiveness and healing. Chapter 29 is a letter. It is written to those people who have been exiled, taken into captivity in Babylon. It is a message sent directly from God to his people to assure him, assure them that although they have done wrong in his sight, having forsaken their purpose to worship the Lord, he has not forgotten them and his promises to them and that one day he will restore them to the land that was promised to them. But take note, the verse before where we started reading says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. When 70 years have passed, not all the exiles will live to see the return. For a few families, it will be those taken as children who will go back as older people. But many more will have been born in captivity and never have known the land of their fathers. Their sin and our sin today has consequences. God spoke to people then and he still does so today. People sometimes ask me, how does God speak to you? Do you hear an actual voice? And if you do, how do you know it's him? I can only answer that by telling you of my personal experience. For years, I was unsure what I was supposed to be hearing. God never seemed to speak to me. People around me talked of people speaking to them, but it never seemed to happen to me. I began to think there was something wrong with me. Maybe I wasn't holy enough. But once I started to read my Bible regularly, I began to realize that God was speaking to me through the words I read. By that I mean, say I was feeling very sad, grieving over all that I had lost. I'd read a passage and realise that one or two of the verses contained a promise that I could apply to me in my situation. Let me give you an example of what I mean. 
At the time that I was grieving the death of my daughter, I read a passage in Isaiah 61 verse 3. When talking about God's provision, it says this, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord. And I knew that God was speaking to me. And the more you read the Bible, the more you come tuned into it happening. Verse 11, Jeremiah's plans that we're looking at today has come to have great significance to me personally. God has used it time and again to alert me to a time of change. Occasionally that change is good and easy, plans come into fruition. But also, and perhaps more significantly, it has sometimes meant that things are going to become uncomfortable. Something like a sudden and unexpected, perhaps unwanted, change of job. Another way God speaks to me is when I'm sitting quietly on my own with God. An image may come into my mind, or maybe the words of a hymn, or a verse, which hold a message for me. Being able to identify this happening comes with experience when we are open to receive from our Father. And how do I know it's him and not random thoughts? Because through time I have learned to recognize his voice, his touch, his nature. And that only comes with familiarity. And what he tells me will never go against Bible truths. And quite often someone else will say something to me which will agree with what I have learned. So in the example I gave you about the verses containing the phrase, beauty from ashes, within a couple of days of reading that, a friend gave me a copy of Jennifer Reese Larkin's book, Beauty from Ashes. God's confirmation that it was his message for me from him. Let's give some thought now to plans. Jeremiah assures the exiles that God hasn't forgotten them, that he has a plan in future for their future benefit. Think back to when you were younger. What plans did you have? All of us have plans, hopes, dreams, schemes, but they don't always turn out the way we expect. Some of our plans do happen, but maybe not entirely as we would have liked. Some fall by the wayside as we move through life and we change and leave them behind. And others change as our tastes change. So our plans for all our efforts sometimes happen, may not yet have happened, or may never happen. But God's plans are not like that. God knew us before we were conceived. He knew who our parents would be, knew exactly who we would be, and he knew where we would live. God wanted you and I in his world to be part of his creation and to become his children. <coughs> we are not accidents, no matter what the circumstances of our birth. We are planned and are valued by God. There's no doubt that there are times when God puts us in places we don't like so that we are forced to confront our own weaknesses. And we will often be in those places longer than we would like or choose. But those times are wasted if we mope about or complain or become bitter at God. Those times are redeemed, made of value, 
if we use them to grow in our relationship with God. If you're in a hard place right now, do not despair and do not think that God has forgotten you. <coughs> when our young people are going away to college or to work abroad, we remind them of these words in Jeremiah, that God has a plan for them. And although times may be rough and things not work out as they expect, he will bring them through. And that is important for them to know. But we miss the most important bit. We leave out the next couple of lines, that lines that contain precious truths. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Yes, God is there and he has a plan and he will work in his timing for our good, but only when we ask him and allow him to do so. <laughs> Just as God never wanted Judah or Israel to be enslaved by the more powerful nations around them, so he fails toward us. Judah was carried off into exile and so are we when we neglect or reject God. Or our sin may not be sexual immorality like Judah's. We may not be defiling the temple with money changing and usury, but we still defile this holy place when we come unprepared to worship. When we're more concerned about what we're going to have for our lunch instead of focusing on God. Or when we're glancing at our watches thinking, how much longer is this going to go on? instead of allowing God to speak to us during the message. We have sidelined God, allowed ourselves to act like we are important, like we are in control. We have lost sight of our gracious Saviour and all he has done for us on the cross and does for us every day. Instead, we are inclined to focus on what we don't have. Shame on every one of us. God loved us so much that he sent his only son to die for each one of us. And all we do is complain. People say, how can God allow such and such to happen? It's not God's doing. It's ours. We live in a fallen world and sin and sickness and evil deeds are symptoms of that fall. We are God's children and we are to be intercessors before the throne of grace. We should be praying for the world and the need we see. Instead, our prayers are most commonly too small and petty, self-serving and insular. We should be praying, thy kingdom come. Instead we pray, look after me and mine. Don't believe me? Well, when was the last time you prayed for the scientists working to find a cure for cancer or any other of those horrible diseases out there? That would, God would give them knowledge and wisdom and the stamina to follow the trail to a cure. Or how often have you prayed for the people who are trying to steer all the warring factions to find peace in the Middle East, praying that they would have the right words on their tongue at the right time? And oh, we are good at bemoaning all the farmers coming into our country. But when was the last time we prayed that their country would become like ours, so they and their children could have a safe and secure future in their own country? 
Prayer is our greatest weapon in our fight against the enemy, Satan, but we don't use it. We have allowed ourselves to become lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, but blase, expecting everything to miraculously turn out all right. I'm blaming God when it doesn't. Stop it. We are on this earth to worship God, to spend our lives in adoration of the one true God, our almighty creator, our savior, our father and our friend, and to bring our praise and petitions to him who is greater than all, Alpha and Omega. Adonai. Start reading your Bible every day. That is bread and meat to our souls. God's words bathing us in his warmth and love. And spend time alone with him in prayer and talking to him. Pray to God as not sitting with your eyes closed and your hands clasped in your lap. It can be walking up and down the living room giving off buckets. But it's true, isn't it? Prayer should be real, not some sort of right. Get rid of the distractions. Turn off the TV. Put your mobile on silent. In fact, put it in a drawer. Discipline yourself to spend time with God every day. D.L. Liddy was an eminent preacher and evangelist in the second half of the 19th century. By the end of his life, he had established a Bible college, written books, and spoken to crowds of thousands across America and England. Even so, he once wrote this. I prayed for faith and thought that someday faith would come down and strike me like lightning. But faith did not seem to come. Then one day I read in Romans, now faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I had closed my Bible and prayed for faith. I now opened my Bible and began to study and faith has been growing ever since. You know, we really have no excuse we live at a time when we have limitless resources at our fingertips. Books on every Bible subject imaginable are ready to download at the touch of a button. And we even have the option of listening using audiobooks. When D.L. Moody became a Christian, he could hardly read his Bible. But he was on fire for Christ. What are we on fire for? What are you and I passionate about? Consider the last line of this passage. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. How much of your heart is given to God? Who or what is our priority? We talk about having a healthy work-life balance, but very often it can't actually be healthy because the most important element is missing, God. So let's think about our individual setup, and you can fill in yours as we go. We have family, possibly a job, friends, me time, our time, entertainment, study, church, organizations, and on and on. I'm sure you, in your circumstance of others, I haven't even thought of. But where exactly did God come into that? And yet we expect God to be our firm foundation, our rock, our comfort. But we don't ever give him the time or the space to be those things to us. Even as Christians, we have pushed God into a little corner and given him a level of importance in our lives, which is, in some cases, lower than our pet. So 
I say again, Jesus. Our New Testament reading is from Paul's time in Athens. Athens then was famous for its love of beautiful objects and magnificent buildings and there were statues and temples everywhere to gods and emperors and other famous people. As Paul walks through Athens looking at all of this, he becomes very uneasy in his own spirit, knowing that these shrines and temples are wrong and displeasing to God. At that time, it was the passion of Greek men to sit about and listen to new ideas and debate with each other which was the better path to follow, the latest ideas, and so on. Most Athenians thought dead is dead. So they developed religions which helped them feel better about that. One of the groups was the Epicureans. They figured that since everybody is going to die someday, we should use the time we have to experience as much pleasure as we can. Their attitude was eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. And doesn't that sound like so many people today? The opposite of the Epicureans were the Stoics. For them, life consisted of being born, growing up, going to work, paying your taxes and then dying. So they just accepted whatever came along stoically. They never got too excited about anything because to him, there was, or to them, there was no point. The next bad thing was just around the corner. The Greeks had invented gods for all needs. Gods they could wheel out when they wanted, but ignore when not required. Do we do the same thing? Have we made God into our image of what we think he should be, instead of who and what he really is? Throughout history, that is exactly what people have tried to do with God. In the Old Testament, the Israelites had allowed religion and religiosity to build up. God was in the temple, they took him out once a week, said the prayers, offered the sacrifices, but then as soon as they left, they ignored God until the next week. The men of Athens have made their own gods too, ones they can control. Paul gets permission to address them. He starts by telling them that he has noticed a shrine to the unknown God. Remember, gods made by man are vain and capricious. You gave them offerings to keep them on your side. So someone had this made in case there was some God out there that was going to be offended at being overlooked. Paul tells them he knows who this unknown God is and he is much bigger than their imaginations. This God is the one who created the world and everything in it. He doesn't need a temple to live in, and neither does he need people to do things for him. Instead, he breathed life into the first man, Adam, and from Adam, God has created the nations to inhabit the whole earth at a time of God's choosing and within the lands he has appointed for them. And God has done all this that man would in turn look for him, would search for God, and that in seeking for God, the man or woman would find that God was not far away at all. In fact, he was right here all the time. We have hardened our hearts, making it easy for us to ignore God to fail to listen when he calls us to obedience. God is not far away. He's not hiding from us, not wanting us to find him. Instead, he's right here, right now. God is still speaking if we will let him. If you don't know him as personal saviour, then I beg you, Turn to him now. Tell him in your heart. Speak to him quietly inside. Tell him you know you're a sinner and that he died to save you. 
and ask them into your life today. Or maybe you are a Christian, but you've allowed your personal relationship with God to drift. And now you're not sure how to get back. Exile is not the end. Repent, turn around, return. Our natural man does not acknowledge our need for God and salvation, but God's grace is greater. God's love reaches out and touches our hearts. Respond to him today. Seek him with all your heart. Fall in love with your maker all over again. And then you will find him. Right where he has always been. Beside you. Listening and waiting to welcome you home. Amen. Let's sing. My worth is not in what I am. is good. Render to no one evil for evil. 
strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honour everyone, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us always. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.